can't see anyone. They've been sponsored. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's, well, I just want to hear that because we want to hear a lot, of, a lot of chatter tonight. I'm looking forward to this. Look, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second great FMA debate. Crikey, I was going to say in my notes, it's great to see so many faces here, but I can't see you. So, uh, But I did notice there are a few new ones as well, and it's nice to see the average age coming down a little bit to these audiences. Um, some of us have brought it up. It's all right, Ainsley. And, oh, that's a, that's a fine. Whose phone's doing that? Just stop that right now. I've got a good manager you could uh, put some of that money with later if you want, uh, if there was a fine. Um, as I said, it's being live streamed as well. And I want to say a, a great thank you and, and welcome to those that have taken the time to uh, watch this uh, in virtual reality. Wow, I wasn't even trying to be funny then. <laughs> um, what, what I was going to say, though, it, it does seem a bit of a lifetime ago when we had the last, uh, well, first FMA great debate back on the 20th of February in 2020. And my goodness, how has the world changed since then? If I said that night that we were going to go through a global pandemic, pandemic countries, cities, businesses and, and schools were going to close down, that we'll be working from home and Zooming uh, most days. Millions of people will be out of, their, out of a job. Interest rates will be at all-time lows. Investors would experience one of the biggest market drops of all time. Paul Gregory uh, would uh, turn away from being poacher to gamekeeper. <laughs> and he was poacher and gamekeeper before, so he's done a bit of a round trip there. And also Rob Everett, bless him. Um, but don't thank me yet. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, who would have thought he would have been leaving in 18 months' time? So um, quite a lot's been going on, and if you thought that I was looking at a crystal ball, you'd be wondering kind of what I was smoking, probably, if I'd said that back in uh, February. But that's exactly what we've gone through. The impact of COVID-19 has affected everyone in some way or another, and our industry has seen some significant market swings, massive disruption, and incredible growth in new investors entering the market for the very first time. I think fueled primarily by falling bank deposit rates, greater accessibility to the markets, and, dare I say, uh, the strength of social media, which is a great segue, I think, to our moot tonight, which is Kiwis are better off investing through experienced advisors rather than trying to do DIY. It's a hot topic, and there's been a lot of discussion, robustness around this. And I think with our two panels tonight, gifted individuals as they are, uh, we're going to hear some wonderful uh, conversations and robust views. But before we kick things off, I'd like to invite our host, a current chef of our industry town, <laughs> Rob Everett, Chief Executive of the FMA, to say a few words. Welcome, Rob. Nice words, though, not, not like last time when you were a bit nasty. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, I better get rid of this then. Um, <laughs> well, uh, good evening, evening everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to everyone online, which isn't quite as a foreign uh, thing as David seems to think it is. Um, <laughs> so uh, as you heard, we're going to talk about a real hot topic tonight. We really want to get this um, subject out there and have people um, thinking about it and talking about it. It's a real game changer for our industry. So um, hopefully this uh, this evening will prompt a, a few words. So um, I'm just going to say a few brief words of introduction and then hand over to the stars of the show. Um, I've written here, I'll be short, but I knew David would start chuckling. So um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take that joke out of his pocket before he's even started. Um, and look, I, I really appreciate the speakers and the judges who've, who've come tonight. Um, I'm hoping we don't get into roasting of the judges because I think that would be very poor. Um, but anyone, uh, anyone who watched the last debate knows that there was a bit of back and forth and a bit of banter. Um, so very brave of you all. <laughs> There's a good reason why I'm sat down there and not up there. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to say a few words about the, the research we've done, the survey we've done, um, just, to, just to tee this up tonight. Um, and we're releasing this, uh, this research tomorrow. So that research looks at um, the drivers for people um, moving into investing for the first time. 
um, often through some of the platforms presented uh, here tonight or represented here tonight. We're looking at what, what the drivers are, what the attitudes and behaviors are of people once, once they get in. Um, we've done that because we think uh, we've seen a significant change in our markets. We want to understand a bit better um, what's causing that, um, where we can operate, uh, where the platforms should operate. So um, it's an important topic for us. Um, and it really has been a game changer globally uh, in terms of uh, global markets, um, making invest investing accessible to a much greater range of people. Um, and the people that have got themselves involved in this space who probably wouldn't have been involved in the past um, are feeling very positive about it. Um, obviously, that may reflect uh, fairly bullish markets, but you know, for sure, um, it's good to have people engaged in our markets, and it's good to have people feeling positive about that. Um, we're also encouraged, and I will say just maybe a little bit surprised, to, to see that most of those investors coming in um, actually had a reasonably good sense of, of how they should be operating, the, the sorts of things they should be thinking about, uh, taking a long-term view. Um, we're not seeing as much uh, day trading or short-term trading as perhaps uh, we might have expected, with only 2% of the people we survey uh, owning up to day trading, at least. Um, I don't know what the real stat is. Um, <laughs> But nonetheless, you know, whilst we see all of those good intentions, uh, human nature does get in the way. Um, and FOMO, uh, fear of missing out, is a big driver. Um, and don't we all know it? Um, anyone who's tried to host a drinks event in Auckland will know that David has terrible FOMO and always pitches <laughs> up when he's, when he's not invited. Um, wow. Sorry, that, that's not in the research. That's just... That's just, that's just um, although a few people did comment, actually, in the research. <laughs> So about one third of the investors who were, who were quizzed uh, admitted to having jumped uh, into an investment over the last couple of years because they didn't want to miss out because their mates were doing it or they read it on some social media site. Um, and you're, talking, uh, you're being talked to by the guy who put his entire first bonus in investment banking into internet stocks. Um, and I was a genius for about 18 days, <laughs> at which point, and I think it was about 2000, the internet market completely blew up and crashed. So um, fear of missing out writ large right here. Um, <laughs> a salutary lesson. Um, so, so we are, as, as a regulator, we, we know we are dealing with a world that's different to the one that the regulations were written for. It's different from what probably most of us um, grew up. Uh, and in particular, investing has become a social activity. Um, and a lot of people, uh, and you saw this in the GameStop phenomenon in the States, are investing less because they're trying to build long-term wealth and more because they're trying to have a crack at the man, um, which before I was a regulator, I would have encouraged, but I'm apparently not allowed to anymore. Um, so, so those investors are influenced by different things than perhaps uh, we were used to or we were expecting. Uh, they're influenced by online forums, they're influenced by their friends, they're influenced by commentary from people they've never met and quite frankly have no reason to, um, to trust or believe. Um, and sometimes they have an emotional connection with a brand um, uh, and that's enough for them to, to pile in. So um, in the workshops we did, uh, the people we spoke to were very clearly really buzzed about the environment in which they're operating and particularly buzzed about the opportunity to meet other people who are in that space and share war stories and tips and all the rest of it. Um, I'd like to say they were equally buzzed by meeting the FMA staff who uh, ran those workshops, but um, that didn't feature in the feedback. Um, sorry, I, I can't see you, but I don't know you're all here. Um, uh, and a point I want to make here is that it can be easy for the establishment to demonize um, people piling into some of these markets, um, particularly when you think about the extreme events that happened around GameStop. Um, and we, we worry, of course, about gamification. Uh, we worry about gateways to gambling. We worry about in, irresponsible um, investing. Um, but we were actually somewhat reassured by the research, uh, which told us that most investors uh, knew they should have a plan. Uh, they indeed claimed to have a plan, and they intended to stick with it. So it's a start, um, and it does show that we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be dismissive of, of people piling into that. Um, on the flip side, just as an example, I think something like 28% of the investors we surveyed were already in cryptocurrencies, and another 6 or 7% were intending to get into cryptocurrencies. And that's a sizable proportion, because it's up to a, a third of all the people we surveyed uh, were in there now. Again, if you're into Dogecoin, or as I call it, Doggycoin, um, <laughs> uh, for a couple of hundred bucks like I am, 
you know, that's, that's just a bit of fun and driven mostly by your teenage daughter. But um, <laughs> uh, if you put your life savings into it, then perhaps that's, uh, that's a, a bit of a risk that we need to respond to. Uh, a further 4% um, were either in or considering in investing in derivatives. Um, and whilst that's a small number, you know, derivatives are complex. The risk that goes with them is different to investing in some of the more mainstream asset classes. And that's something that we'd be um, interested in. Um, there's a ton of stuff in the report, and I think we've got some here tonight, so I'd encourage you to either take a copy with you um, or, uh, or to access it online. Um, and as I said, uh, we intend to use that research to understand better um, what's bringing investors into this space, uh, what, they're, what they're doing, um, how the providers are interacting with them, and work out how we can influence both sides of that equation to try and make sure we don't end up in a situation where the current positive feeling and confidence that's in the survey about operating our markets um, disappears because people get burnt. Um, and there will, of course, at some point be a correction. Um, and we hope that the current enthusiasm and confidence survives uh, that if we can. So that's a challenge for the regulators. It's a challenge for the platforms, a challenge for the media, a challenge for the investors. It's challenging for everyone. Um, but, you know, I, I will reiter reiterate what I said at the beginning. We are thrilled to see people um, participating in our market, and quite a few of the people in the survey admitted that they were, they were in it just to have fun, but also to learn a little bit, to learn a little, little bit about how markets worked, to learn about their own appetite for loss, um, and you can't knock that. I think that's a, that's a great thing to have. So, um, you know, we want, we want those investors to continue to evolve, we want them to stay the course and hopefully evolve into um, serious participants in our markets. I think that's, uh, that's something that we all want. So I'll finish by saying um, th this, is, this is intended to be fun. So we have encouraged a bit of, um, a bit of jollity. Um, I think last time there was some real celebrity roasting. I think Paul Gregory managed to get the words vampire squid into the <laughs> conversation somewhere. I think we all know who that was aimed at. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to leave Dave, David to, to kick it off this evening and to say to all of you, I hope you have um, great fun, and I'll see you in the bar afterwards. Thank you. Great, Rob. Thanks for that. Um, look, I thought it was a short speech, but... No, it's okay. <laughs> um, Look, on a personal note, because I can get a little like, you know, I just want to put something out there. I can say on behalf of my good self and, and my colleagues that are here tonight and who might be watching, um, you know, we're sad to see you leaving the FMA. It's been a pleasure working with you in a number of different initiatives. There have been some, you know, quite good, uh, robust discussions and challenges along the way, but I think you've brought a lot to the FMA, and I think, um, you know, you're going to be sorely missed. And I also believe, and I wish, uh, that you, 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 I wish you the very best for your future endeavours. I also uh, am looking forward to your farewell functions, because I understand there's going to be a number. Um, <laughs> I, I know I'll probably be on the list of a few of them, but just in case, <laughs> I want to get this on record that I will be available. Um, <laughs> and on that note, it, it got me thinking, because you know I'm kind of into music a wee bit, and I thought, well... It'd be lovely to do a little boily playlist for you, kind of just reflecting, Ainsley, just a little bit, about the, the nature and good work that Rob's done, both at a personal level and, and also, you know, kind of the work at the FMA. So I thought I'd just run this very quickly, just a wee test to see how I'm going uh, in respect of the topics and songs. So I thought God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols is a good nod to where you've come from. You've uh, seen the light and come to Aotearoa, and uh, you're going to be here, I suspect, for a long time, not just a good time. Um, stuck in the middle with you, which kind of brings us together a little bit, doesn't it? Uh, in, in a good way, just, just careful. I, I, I raised that one because um, I, when COVID-19 started, I did do a, a playlist that I connected with a lot of colleagues in the industry, and I wanted one really happy song that we could create something that, you know, it was a bit dark through that March-April period, and um, that was a song that Rob uh, gratefully donated to that playlist. And um, I thought I thought that it's a great track actually, and it r reminds me of Reservoir Dogs, which is a, a great movie as well. Um, I, I I do get the feeling you can't always get you want get what you want sometimes, Rob, <laughs> um, but you do keep trying, which is good. And so the Rolling Stones was a good option there. Um, <laughs> 
this is a little controversial, but um, I see red by split ends. I'd, <laughs> I, I honestly have not seen you too grumpy, but um, when you're giving the banks and the insurance companies a little bit of a, a, a nod, I think, I think that's quite, quite nice and well done you for doing that, I say. And um, just a personal thing, don't you forget about me as a bookend on the end. <laughs> So how, sounds all right, I thought I might have to do a bit more work, but I've, I've got a few more tracks, but I probably can't share those ones here tonight. Um, right, let's go on and meet the teams who are going to be battling it out. Uh, for the affirmative, we've got the one and only Andrew Baskand, Managing Director of Harbour Asset Management. Uh, for the affirmative, we've got Chloe Robertson, um, Financial Advisor of Certus. Wonderful to see you there. And, and Helen, Skinner, Head of Emerging Wealth at Craig's Investment Partners. Great team, great effort, um, well-known people within the industry. And look, and I, I thought it's probably worthwhile just mentioning, you know, we're here to have fun, to be funny, be thoughtful, Anthony. Um, <laughs> oh, hey, and uh, just settle. Um, but I also want to make sure that we don't want any blatant advertising promotion of the organisations that we work with tonight, because it is about entertainment, and it's not who you work for, and, uh, you know, I don't believe in that at all. But just for completeness, <laughs> I am here, and I'm not giving any financial advice at all. I mean, I just want to stress that, because we're in a regulated environment, and... <laughs> This is a regulated industry event, uh, but I do have my Mint Asset Management disclosure <laughs> statement. If anyone has got problems about any advice that I may or may not give you tonight. Um, did the camera get the close up on that? That's all good. Okay. So, <laughs> right. Um, for the negative, we've got Sonia Williams, founder and director of Sharesies. Welcome. Anthony Edmonds, managing director. It's quite a big title for you, mate. <laughs> of IS and Invest Now, so you're managing director of two businesses. That's pretty important. And Kristen Lundman, co-founder of GM and GM at Hatch. Anthony, it's great to see you lifting the average age of the negative team up a little bit tonight as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the nicest possible way, and you can't be nasty to me when... Do you get to add to diversity in our industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, is, that, that, that's so true. Um, a new component this year, um, because we think it's important that we get some independence, is the introduction of the judging panel, who ultimately uh, are going to pick out our winning team tonight. So let me introduce the judges to you. We've got Madison Reedy from News Hub. Welcome, Madison. Oliver Manda, New Zealand Share Association. And Lachlan Wallace, AUT Investment Club. It's so great that you guys are here tonight. Um, we got a bit awkward last time. I think we were going up and down and didn't know where to sit or stand, and it was a bit silly. So this time we've got independent judges that I know that you'll make a great decision and ultimately pick the right winner tonight. So the debate, let's kick it off for the affirmative team, led by Captain, uh, well, by Andrew, sorry, followed by Sonia and the negative. Basically, I'm not going to be here anymore from... That's that stage we're going to have when one speaker finishes, the next speaker will come up. They've got three minutes, so they've got to be bloody funny and they've got to be really good at what they're talking about. <laughs> I just don't want to put any pressure on anyone tonight at all, because it's quite hard doing this, you just, I'm just saying. Um, I will give them a reminder at 30 seconds before that three minutes is up with a wee ding -a -ling, and then there'll be a lot of banging the bell after that if they don't stop. Um, at the end of each of the, the, th the panels going through the areas of completion, um, the, each captain will be allowed two minutes to wrap up their, their, um, or, or their, their view. Um, and we, we're starting with the affirmative and the negative, closing that off. But we do encourage audience participation because that will give the judges an indication whether you think they suck or whether they're really good. <laughs> Well, they're, well, they're just, well, they're going to be funny or not. So I think bonus points for funny is really important. Um, it will gen generally, I think, it help believe the judges pick the right uh, team on the night. But that said, I don't want any booing or any throwing of uh, vegetables or fruit or any other matter. Um, if there's not a consensus, you're still talking, you're just judging. You know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm nearly finished, so it's all right. So if you all three don't agree, we're going to have a two out of three ain't bad by meatloaf by determining the outcome, so majority will rule on this one. But um, 
I hope that you will, both all of you individually, choose your winner and we'll see where that, where that lands us tonight. So uh, that should be a bit of fun. So now it's my pleasure, it's the end of my little presentation, uh, and I want to invite Andrew to start this proceedings off. Welcome, Andrew. Well, kia ora, and thank you, Boyle. That was fantastic. What a, uh, you could have carried it away yourself. Uh, esteemed judging panel audience and audience online and our playful negative panel. It's about time we focused on the differences between creating wealth and, as Rob has said, learning and playing around. <laughs> well, for us, Chloe, Helen and I, this is a robust debate. It's about experience and facts versus play and just learning, because investors want to safeguard their money. They want to, as the moot says, be better off. If you want to play with your money, my, my word, there are many sand pits you could play in. <laughs> but would, would, yes, you would, you would DIY build your own sand pit, fair enough. But would you DIY build your own house? We say, no. Right? You? No, we say no, because you would hire experienced advisors, ones that are licensed and regulated. Yeah, hello. <laughs> countless quantitative studies, that's the maths, countless quantitative studies show that DIY investors, well, they aren't just worse off, they're considerably worse off. And Chloe has the facts. By all means, have fun, try your hand with a little flutter. Yes, certainly. Be a hobbyist. Channel your inner wolf on Wall Street. <laughs> Good luck, we say. Good luck. But here, here, quietly, shh, here, there's a serious problem with social media. Yes, and investment advice. The investment news diarrhea used as a source of excitement on some social media sites, well, in those sand pits, we think it's a worry. In fact, Rob, you remind me, it wouldn't surprise me if the regulator started the compulsory wearing of nappies <laughs> in these sand pits just for the protection of other players. Because no one, no one wants messy mistakes when it comes to money. But, but here, it's serious. Even with nappies on, will you be better off DIY looking after your retirement savings. We say no. Very clearly, experienced advisors engage with boards and management on important issues like climate change and diversity. We aren't just empowering one generation. We are making all generations better off. So we say, we say, investors are much better off using experienced advisors DIY is for playing in sand pits, preferably with nappies on. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, when I put the venue into my Google Maps, it said experimental shows, food and drinks. Uh, so I think we're really in for a treat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why is the DIY approach better for Kiwis? I'll start with four reasons. It's more accessible. One of the criticisms thrown around about Sharesies is that people are driven to investing by FOMO. And they're right. And it's no wonder we have a fear of missing out. We have been missing out, and it's got to change. So just so we're clear, for this debate, we'll be talking about all Kiwis, not just the 1% of people who have access to advisor services. <laughs> um, and the proof is in the pudding. Thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs> uh, and the proof is in the pudding. Um, across our platforms, we've been able to provide access to people who without DIY would not have been able to invest. On Sharesies alone, this is 415,000 Kiwis, 8% of the population. People who have together invested over $1.5 billion. This is money that would have not, otherwise not been invested and is flowing in to support New Zealand and global companies. It's also more engaging. No paper, no forms, no telephone calls. You're in the driver's seat. 
Everything is digital. Your groceries, your banking, why shouldn't investing be the same? It's far more convenient and it's on your terms. And the stats are proving it too. In FMA's latest research, it shows that 80% of people are feeling more positive about investing since the launch of online platforms. It's also more personal. To quote the FMA's website, it states that... <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I hope the laughter doesn't take from my time. Um, <laughs> it says, advisors are helping you identify what you need, what's right for you, and it's all about helping to set yourself up for the future. No one knows your goals better than you. And this was made pretty obvious to me when I remember early on going to an advisor, my first advisor's conference, and we were asked to break into groups and come up with ways to help, save, help people save for their retirement. I was shocked when three out of the five groups presented back some kind of electric shock or pain uh, to help people stay on track <laughs> with their spending. I don't know about you, but that's not my idea of fun. Uh, and also, you learn by doing, so lived experience is far better uh, than any advice you're given. Um, you only really know the meaning of measure twice, cut once, <laughs> when you fail to measure twice. <laughs> um, um, it's also more empowering. We're investors, not clients. Knowledge is power. Technology, technology has made access to info even easier than before and to make sure that investors have the tools and support they need to DIY. Our investors have inclusive access to CEOs and leaders of New Zealand's top companies <laughs> and get to ask them questions. I could go on. <laughs> Good evening. DIY investors have been shown to underperform markets by an estimated 5% year on year according to real investment advice in the USA. Let me just say that again unless the opposition hasn't heard me. DIY investors have been known to underperform markets by 5%. That ladies and gentlemen is all we need to know about how worse off DIY investors are than when they're going it alone. As much as us Kiwis hate to admit it, our number eight wire can't build our way out of the financial quicksand that the average DIY investor can get into. And why is that? Well, firstly, DIY investors are not financially fluent. As a country, we are more confident talking about the housing market or Cindy's next move around the barbecue than we are talking derivatives, currency hedging or PE ratios. And that's backed up by the Retirement Commission's Financial Capability Survey which showed that an average adult in New Zealand performs badly on such things as long-term savings and making informed choices on financial products. And that's probably because a lot of DIY investors rely on the wrong source of information to make their decisions. DIY investors find out information at the same place they find out their new recipe. The FMA has issued warnings about the impact on social media, speculation and how that has on investment decisions and the impact. Shares his own co-founder, Lighton Roberts, even told Stuff that there is a disproportionate amount of conversations online about small companies and penny stocks. And as a result, DIY investors make up a greater percentage of trades in small cap stocks and they've lost a lot of money in the process. That is largely because DIY investors are short-term thinkers and emotional. They see a shiny Bitcoin. Let's buy it. They see the storms coming. Let's sell it. They don't know what to do. And according to recent research from the FMA, during the pandemic, $1.2 billion was moved out of growth funds into conservative funds in the age group of 26 to 35. Better off? I don't think so. So what happens when all these emotional, short-term Facebook surfing financial novice get on DIY platforms? <laughs> well, they start trading. They buy, they sell, they think they know better. Which is great business for this lot, because all you hear is ching ching, ching ching, ching ching, every time it happens. They would be far better off sticking with the experts. The experts are trained specialists. 
They speak this language. For some of you in the crowd with 40 years experience, there's 80,000 hours researching financial markets, reviewing products and understanding clients' goals. On the contrary to DIY investors, we take a long-term view. Investors are better off parking their real financial future with the expert advisors because DIY investing is playing around in the sandpit and that's better left to the playground. Chloe's, Chloe's bucket had a picture, picture of an advisor on it, that little shark. <laughs> you can have it back. But no, seriously, uh, I love DIY investors, DIY, uh, as, as well as loving advisors, but uh, this is a debate and I love winning as well, so we're here to win. Uh, look, in my mind, Kiwis are money rational. They work out the right thing to do with their money and do it. Look at Kiwi's love affair with residential investment property. Um, that thing's been a winner. It's been, like, I've gone to the moon on it. Now, how many advisors would have told their clients to roll like that? Not many, if any. <laughs> you know, that was, yeah. Andrew Baskin, oh yeah, that cheeky smile. You're like the Damien McKenzie of the investment management industry. <laughs> But you know, your funds on our DIY platform are simple, easy to Im implement for anyone. You know, my point is, is that investing doesn't need to be as complex as the uh, um, pro-advisor team are trying to make you believe. Uh, quickly, the FMA report, 70% of DIY investors got on board uh, on the platforms to find better ways to grow their money. Uh, half of them are, learning, are using platforms to learn about investing. 80% of them are buy and hold people, not day trading or doing those sort of crazy things. You know, their FMA, their FMA survey is evidence and proof that DIY platform users are rational investors, not just some sort of speculators. Uh, almost all are people that financial advisors don't want to deal with. Um, to say that they're better off with experienced advisors who don't want them is simply crazy. You know, especially a lot of those advice businesses, you know, it's great to see two women in the industry. Uh, there's a lot of... <laughs> is, is it? Well, Helen, Helen, you know, your business, you know, it has got that sort of boomer look in amongst the advisors. They even branded it Craig, you know, like... <laughs> yeah. We too could have quoted reports, you know, there was a report written by a stub, stubborn, I mean, a student in Otago the other day who said that the community trust, despite having the best advisors money could buy, had underperformed, while a lot of clever people in the industry thought the report was rubbish. Um, it just highlights the point that, you know, even the people who can afford the best advisors uh, underperform. Um, in this market, Kiwis need to become money rational. Uh, to see them flooding to platforms like Hatch, Sharesies and Investnow in their tens of thousands, is brilliant in my mind. This is a money rational response where people need to get greater financial literacy in a modern world. And so to argue Kiwis would be better off uh, with advisors who don't want them is just plain crazy in my mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, haven't we heard enough from the sandpit? I'd like to focus on what really counts in this debate, and that's the investors. But first, I do just a couple of before I do just a couple of points I'd like to uh, talk about from our dear friends over there. First of all, the point of do we want those clients? Now, um, 
as you guys may know, I work for Craig's, not that I want to promote my business too much, um, but I, I run Emerging Wealth, which means that I have a team of very, uh, well, younger advisors, I have a diversity in my advisor set, and we look after all clients, right from being students up to the boomers, and we will help anyone, so uh, yeah, come over. Um, but, um, we've also heard a lot, though, about direct access to market, and I'd just like to, uh, to quote really uh, something that's come from a DIY Facebook page of a client that's getting direct access to market. Now this client has said, I'm fairly new to investing. I have invested in one company, but I'm not getting much of a return. Am I assuming the more you invest, the better the return? <laughs> now I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure this person needs some expert financial advice. And I'm sure when you guys read this, you must shudder. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason there's a bouncer on the door at the casino. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason there's a teacher at the front of that tuck shop stopping those kids from eating those sweets. It's experience advice that counts, not how you access that trade. So let's get back to the real world and I'll tell you about a couple of clients that we've had come to us at Craig's from DIY Platforms. I've changed the names of the clients just for privacy purposes. So uh, the first is Emma. She's a bank manager. Uh, Emma told us that she'd bought five shares with one of these DIY platforms and she had built a nice little sand castle in her play pit. <laughs> And then along came March 2020 and the wave of COVID and it washed out Emma's investment. She said she was a bit shaken up, but she took a deep breath, as I'm going to, <laughs> and uh, she rebuilt her sandcastle to about 10,000 bucks, which she was quite pleased with. But deep down, she knew the next wave was coming and she needed some solid foundation and some expert advice to get through it. So she came to us. We developed a long-term plan that was aligned with her goals, Ooh. and in her words, it grew to grow a meaningful investment, not just play money. The second one I'm going to talk to you about very quickly is uh, Tom. Uh, he came to us, him and his friends had had some accounts at a DOA platform, and they admitted they didn't really know what they were doing. They had got their ideas from Facebook and from friends. They'd had their money in two tech stocks because they thought it was the best way to maximise their returns. No one had made any money. So Tom came to us because he realised he said he'd been playing and he wanted some solid advice. Tom is 16. Tom's going home. Tom's going home. <laughs> Okay, but one last thing, one last thing. Negative team, just got to say, I'm going to give you my business card because we know your clients are going to come to us when they want to be better off. Wow. New Zealand has always been a do-it-yourself nation. Thanks to our can-do attitude and resourcefulness of Kiwis, our number eight wire mentality has always led us to believe that we can build something from nothing. And this collective confidence is ingrained in our Kiwi psyche. Traditional investing is not unlike the old wooden posts, stone walls and hedges that used to keep the stock from straying. But we replaced these earlier foundations. We found newer, innovative ways to get the job done that were faster, easier and stronger. Of course, we're doing the same with investing. We're Kiwis, we're resourceful. DIY investing is about people having control of their money. It's a revolutionary learn by doing way of growing wealth where investors finally have access, access to the options and tools that were once only available to the financial elite. The modern investor made this shift happen. We didn't. They're the ones turning the industry on its head. The power is now firmly back in the hands of the people, right where it belongs. But we're a country of visionaries, not fools, thank you very much. We know when to buy and when to DIY. We're really comfortable with outsourcing our cooking, sometimes our childcare, our nails, and our plumbing. But why on earth would we give others control of our hard-earned money 
when we are a country of educated risk takers that are willing to throw ourselves off bridges, climb the highest mountains, and do our own electrical wiring at home. <laughs> there will always be a place for financial advisors in New Zealand. Inti Papa with the other relics of yesteryear. <laughs> but seriously, there are 10, roughly 10,000 registered advisors here in New Zealand, of whom I emailed last week asking what to do with the $10,000 inheritance that I'd received. Some implied, some implied, we don't waste your time unless you have $100,000. Others told me to invest it with Invest Now. Most of them simply didn't reply. But do the math, 10,000 experts to service over 600,000 and growing modern investors. The numbers don't add up. Online investment platforms have torn down the barriers that the industry has put up, but not to protect the average investor's best interest, to serve the elite minority. They make exaggerations about how people use our platforms for a dabble or a play, but they're not. These people are building meaningful wealth. The, they're buying and holding. The occasional investor withdraws their money. You know what they're doing? They're paying off their mortgages. They're spending more time with their loved ones. They are quitting the job that they hate. As for downturns and dips, we've been through a few of those. Guess what they're doing? They're holding because they're in it. They're in it for the long term and they're in it with us. We aren't going anywhere and that's because Kiwis want us here. Thank you. Well, we've heard the playful excitement that is the DIY of the future and the past. I'm confused. Uh, you're in the driver's seat to where? A crash? I'm not sure. Uh, it's the way to empower a generation uh, because it'll be faster, better, and I didn't get it. More wealthy? No, I didn't hear that. Will it make you better off? I didn't hear that. Eventually, all entrepreneurs, savers, investors grow up. They grow up because they have parents. They have parents that create boundaries, they have regulators that create rules, and they set objectives. The facts are in. DIY investors are considerably worse off. Chloe highlighted the facts, I've seen them, countless academic studies, and they go on. And we're gathering data. Some of you might have seen an email this week, it's factual. Uh, DIY investors are considerably worse off even in this country. Helen highlighted, sadly, just one case, it was going to be two, but there are <laughs> countless others of, of young people that are coming to the advisors. And I know I can walk into Craig's with 100 bucks for advice. You can actually invest with most fund managers on Invest Now. That is experience advice for $250. You don't need, you don't need to just do it yourself. You can actually go and find technology and get real advice. The quantitative and qualitative analysis is in. I get it, the negative team have their supermarkets, ka-ching, ka -ching, where today's bargain becomes tomorrow's unicorn. Yes, a unicorn in your dreams. You know what happens when the kids have the supermarket aisle open to them. They run to the lollies aisle, don't they? We get a sugar overrun. What I can tell you is this. Investors are much better off using experienced advisors rather than DIY. Good luck in the sand pit, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Well, we didn't bring any props, but we did bring hundreds of thousands of investors <laughs> into the market. Um, so, so many great points, um, but a few that I just couldn't disagree more with, because uh, this is a debate. Um, so if we look to uh, people who don't know enough, right, that was, people don't know enough to manage their own money, um, was one of the things raised. Uh, so how do we expect that to change without providing guidance and support to help build people's knowledge? Arguably, a too heavy reliance on advisors uh, has created a just distrust of your own skills when it comes to fi financial issues, which is probably how we ended up in the spot to begin with. 
Uh, people are capable of understanding their money and their goals. They have to deal with money every day. Let's give them the tools they need for this to be an empowering experience. There was also the comments about trading and, and um, what was happening there. Well, through the volatility of last year, um, we, we saw that uh, over, or across all of our platforms, um, we only saw, like for Shares e specifically, we only saw two net sell days. All of our investors are buying and holding. And uh, when we talk about diversity of portfolios or, or the person who maybe just had one, um, of uh, the typical Shares e's portfolio is made up of three funds and five companies, which sounds pretty diversified to me. Um, and they're in it for the long haul. Um, and I loved how you brought up playing so much and fun, because um, I did wonder why I hadn't been interested in investing before. <laughs> um, and the fact that you saw that as a bad thing. Um, so no matter what the issue uh, that's been raised, technology can solve this through, at scale through product and community and put the power back in the hands of the investors. So what's better for Kiwis? A reliance on limited access to advice that serves a few and creates a distrust of your own skills or ability to learn, or an accessible, engaging, personal and empowering investing experience available to all that harnesses the power of technology. We could find a way to achieve financial empowerment through having access to an experienced advisor, but more likely we'll see the same issues play out. The best path to <laughs> Kiwis investing uh, lies in lies in uh, <laughs> the best path to Kiwi's investing lies in empowering people. It Hello. Does, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to know when you're going to put yeah, mint funds on. I've got my one. Uh, so every advisor here had a day one. Wow. And look at you now. <laughs> um, let's use DIY to create a world where all of us can be experienced advisors. <laughs> Just a couple of things. Um, clearly, clearly, don't listen to any of my instructions. <laughs> so much self-promotion. I'm, I'm disappointed with you, Helen. I was quite shocked. I knew it would come from you, but not her. <laughs> um, wow, quite a bruising affair, wasn't it? And there was humour and there was laughter. And I think now is the time. Uh, we've got ten odd minutes, uh, depending on the questions, and we're gonna, we've got some people to run with microphones. So, to the audience first, do, do we have any questions for the panel at any, any level? Good questions, of course, not dumb ones, so. <laughs> yes? Um, I forgot your name, sorry, Craig. That's Helen, the one that doesn't listen to what I say. You can have her Craig. Craig here. Yeah. <laughs> It's because I'm not a registered financial. I'm not a wow. financial advisor. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's funny you're I, in that team, then, Helen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as I said, we we take investments from as little as 100 bucks. We take any KiwiSaver investment. So absolutely, yeah. And you would have access to a, you'd have a financial advisor, of which there's some in the audience tonight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you would. Yeah. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Would you like my business yeah, card? Yeah, yeah, it's my. I was just wondering, is this on? Um, if your strategy as advisors, your marketing strategy is usually to tell your customers that they're too dumb to manage their own money? Is that usually oh. Oh, Wow. <laughs> Clearly a plant yeah, for where this do you team. Work? <laughs> <laughs> that obvious, just a little obvious, that work? one. Where do you work, young lady? Oh, there you go. Oh. You could have lied. Speaker. Uh, no, no look, that, that's, not, that's not what we do at all. I mean, no. It's a bit of a laugh there. But um, look, last night I actually got an email from a client, a 50-year-old woman whose husband died, and she's been my client for about three years. She doesn't have a huge amount of money. And she emailed me, which was really sweet, to say a big thank you was in the subject line. Thank you for helping me make the right decisions. I feel like I've made my decisions, but I trust your advice along the way. And that made me think, oh, that's why we're here. You know, that's what we're here for. It's not about telling people what to do with their money. It's giving them options and empowering them, but knowing that like, there's a bit of research and skill behind it. So that's what we're here for. Very good. 
Come on, here's your chance. Get a really good question out there that's not biased. <laughs> or not. Is anyone? Yes, gentleman down the middle there. Hello. Um, there are people that would say financial advisors or fund managers are people who are experts because they've spent a career losing other people's money and learning. <laughs> what do you have to say to that? It's really, really interesting. The um, <laughs> <laughs> really interesting. So, uh, so the facts are you live and die by your investment performance. Um, if you if you if you don't have investment performance. You, you don't survive in the industry. This industry, in particular in New Zealand and Australia, um, is full of what we call survivorship bias. I, I could tell you at least a dozen uh, fund managers who didn't have skill that are now uh, bartenders and doing other jobs. So you do live on the true strength of your medium-term uh, performance. And uh, you know, I'm proud to say that people I've worked with uh, and competitors that I've worked with have uh, demonstrated decades of excellent performance in this market. We're lucky in this market, actually. We're really lucky. We, we, can, we can convincingly show you the added value against strong benchmarks that would, would stand the test of time. Uh, it's not so in all markets, but in the US, you could argue the data doesn't support that. But in this market, it does support that. Um, I should say even after fees and after tax. Um, so, I mean, that, I think that's the story. The great thing is, let's be honest, you can access nearly all of these services on platforms. You know, th let's be honest, this debate is it's great because technology is, technology is coming uh, and it's here now and you can access directly most of these services in an advice world, perfect, and a non-advice world. Um, and, and I think that's an important empowerment as well. Love the humor and the banter, uh, but that aside, don't you think both in an ideal world, both should actually coexist in a meaningful way? It's all about educating the investors where to take advice and where to make a DIY call. Why, why can't those two parties work together in that journey? Sorry, I'm, not, I'm like 53, so I couldn't even hear. <laughs> 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 make us uh, fun of a debate <laughs> um, if we did uh, talk about that but obviously yeah we do see a world where we both co coexist and um, it is both mm. there you are <laughs> thanks <Rob. laughs> uh, but 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 I mean that, that, that's because you know there's a certain element of the market that wants something um, and that's just how it is So I have a question for the DIY side. Um, given that you're big fans of the retail Kiwi, having a good crack in the market, would you be comfortable with the New Zealand retail audience having access to derivatives, like the same as they do in the States? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I did this time, actually. It was a little closer and had a microphone. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, probably firstly, I was really surprised to see in that research that the FMA has just done that there's people with derivative exposure and wanting more because these were DIY people and to get to derivative markets you've basically in my mind got to go to offshore platforms which is a risk in itself so I'm sure that's something that the FMA will think about that people sort of are a little discerning in terms of platforms they choose which is intriguing. Um, from a tax perspective people would want to be really careful uh, moving into derivatives because they'd want to understand the tax consequences of them, they're pretty nefarious. Also from a risk perspective, you know, these are easily an investment that even sophisticated investors can get confused and all sorts of things about. Uh, so I would I would caution people strongly before they go and invest but, into And I would add to it that it's actually not a problem to be solved. We always mm. approach things as an approach, like what is the problem that we're solving and for um, in this particular table, it's actually all about democratization of access of, of um, just everything that 
um, most people, the financial elite, have had access to ages, and that's just access to global share markets, access to affordable funds, access to affordable you know, coaching and educational tools, and um, yet uh, no barriers to entry. And so I'm not convinced that's actually a problem to be solved right now, mm. yeah. Yeah. or will be. Side. <laughs> you. Can you really not see me? <laughs> I'll make it quick. For the, d for the DIY side, uh, just on the back of this, I understand that uh, platforms like Hatch, for example, use offshore clearing houses or brokerage. Uh, what What's the risk uh, for the New Zealand investor who uses a DIY platform uh, and they can't fulfill an order, for example. Uh, so I understand uh, in the US, things like GameStop shares, uh, there were a lot of investors in DIY platforms who couldn't exercise their, their, uh, their shares for various reasons. What do you see the risk for a platform like Hatch using an offshore brokerage? I think the, um, to answer the, the second part first is actually there's a big misunderstanding about what, how, why game um, investors couldn't exercise buying or selling with GameStop, and that was just a very unique scenario where clearing houses, in fact, the platforms in the US had to cover any potential losses um, due to volatility, and so I think there's a mis uh, there was a misconception that that was actually... Um, you know, shut down or that was a willing thing and it was just simply a matter of covering um, the potential volatility. But in terms of uh, partners that we use, we do an enormous amount of due diligence on all partners. Since 2008, um, the uh, US share markets and, and partners of, of um, those share, uh, share markets are one of the most highly regulated in the world, one of the most transparent markets in the world, um, which is why it's you know so um, large and, and liquid, I suppose. But um, massive amount of transparency with respect to audits, financials, and so we have a really good handle on um, the financial uh, strength of the partners that we're working with, how all of the systems work, and their track records as well. So high level of confidence there. Should anything go wrong, also since 2008, there have been an enormous, enormous amount of protection for investors that should cover losses in the event of um, fraud and or of bankruptcy. And so there are protections in place that yes, can be accessed by Kiwis that are accessing partners um, on, <coughs> on that side of the world. Great, okay, judges, have you got any questions that you'd like to throw to the panel before you unveil who's gonna be the winner tonight? I've just got one actually. Um, yep. Can we vote for the audience or is that out? <laughs> so, was that in the rules? No, it wasn't. So yeah, but you set the rules. So. Yeah, I know. No one's listening to them tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That's oh, great. Is that it? No. Oh, look, we've got one here. Here we go. No one used the word fees. I'm shocked. So I'm going to bring it up. Once I missed it on my count. I didn't hear fees or value for money. It did it. Oh, sorry, Andrew. I missed that count. I'll make it up to you then. I'll let you give a. Oh, I'll give you a chance to tell us why paying your fees, which are higher than these guys, paying are their worth fees. It. Do you know how much <laughs> this costs? <laughs> Do you know, Madison? Come on, ask the question. Their See, fees I'm can very be a sure lot higher. Fees. If you're only trading a thousand dollars or so, the fees Whoa. here are higher than they are here. You need to know this stuff. You it's can, true. You can so see you that we're can a little access, tender. You can access funds for less than nine basis points. Outrageous. It's outrageous, isn't it? Outrageous. <laughs> How can anyone earn any money on that? I'm excited about this. We don't need to talk about fees. Right. It's that good. You most certainly <laughs> shut that one down. Oh, we've got, yes. What would the fees be on a $100 investment? Again, I'm 60, so um, it's pretty <laughs> cool. a hundred For a $100 investment, what would the fees be? With, with uh, hair uh, or uh, hair? Yeah. Craig's, Sirtis, Harbour. Uh, well, it depends which fund you come into, but it, it can be anywhere between nine basis points or up to 150, your choice. 
So nine basis points, work it out. What's the difference? What's the value you would give on each? What sort of return are we talking if you pay a higher fee? Well, you can invest in e equity funds all the way through to uh, hedge funds. It just depends your your choice. So nine basis points, it's not much. Do you charge performance fees on anything above the OCR rate? Yes, we do. Your choice on, on really high value funds, like a, a derivative long short fund, or a highly concentrated fund, but out of 15 funds, two funds have performance fees at Harbour, and that would be similar to other global opportunities. Yep, well disclosed, in the PDS. <laughs> right, and, okay. And at, and, at Craig, and at Craig's, the fees? So we run a we have, we have funds, we have um, direct shares that you can invest as well, so it's an, it's an open platform that we have as KiwiSaver, only ones to do it for the funds and shares in New Zealand and KiwiSaver, and we also have a, a, a savings product, which is where you can do a minimum 100 bucks. Um, and it depends what you invest in. So if you go into a fund, there's a 35 bips management fee on top of that. But the thing you talked about was value for money, and I think that's the important thing, is to think about what you're actually getting for those services. So, for instance, you might be getting portfolio management, you might be getting financial advice, you may be getting research as well with it that you do at Craig's. So it's whether you're just getting access to a market or the other add-ons as well and whether it right. creates value for money. Thanks, Helen. Promotion again. <laughs> we need a verdict, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So there's a bit of... There's a bit of dead air. You think they would have made this decision before I, I did. I, we've, they're still going. Um, no, I, 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 <laughs> I, do you think so? It looks like a little bit of tension going on. <laughs> on rock and roll. It's a shocking song. Just saying. Rob, you don't like you don't like Starship, do you? <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yep. No, Belinda Carlisle, that's wrong. Yeah, so am I. But I've got standards. Just saying. <laughs> Alrighty. Team, how are we going? Hey, you've each got you've each got one? Yeah. Well, well, well what, why don't you show us who won and then you can tell us why they won. How would that I I'm just trying to get to the beers. That's all I'm <laughs> just dying here. Individually, and then we have come up with a consensus. So we're going to tell you our individual, and then and then tell you the consensus. Should we go one, two, and then because Lachlan's got the decider? Cool. So I'm going. Thank you. <laughs> Affirmative. There was half. Sorry. <laughs> that moved up. There was half a point in it, and it was because of the passion and the props. It feels like you truly believe that you are in it to win it for the retail investor. So purely based on passion. But in saying that, I did love that you guys here played on the psyche of the retail investor and used words like power, control, and access. That was really powerful. But you guys have got it from me. Maybe not the consensus thing. All right, well, like Madison, the score that uh, I came up with was also really close. It was also by half a point. Um, and it's kind of, but I also weighted my um, little bit for criteria. And one thing I was a bit sort of concerned about was that the props were in a format of style over substance, if you will. And I thought they were very good and very passionate, but I have gone for the negative team. <laughs> and. And it isn't, it isn't just a case of, I would say that anyway, let me assure you. Um, and the reason is because, and I, I think one of the audience members picked that up very well, um, 
there is a role for everyone in this industry and there is a role for people at different life stages and with different behaviours and at different times to utilise all of the financial products and services that are available to them. And the fact is that we have platforms now that, and again this is picking up what, what Madison has, has already said, that if that makes it accessible for an 18 year old high school student starting just going to university to get into investing and actually improve their their chances of future wealth and reduce the poverty gap in New Zealand over time, I think that is a great thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I feel like I should, um, I should maybe leave it for a little bit. Just talk about <laughs> Well, we don't need any threats. Jeez. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> just in the real world here, so let's keep going. <laughs> um, so, I thought mine was pretty close as well, but they were in half a point, so that, that changed pretty quickly. Um, I was about three, point, three and a half points off. Um, basically, so, I went for team... Drum roll. <laughs> Affirmative. Whoa! <laughs> Um, and just by the speeches, they were a lot more passionate, I feel. Um, oh, I know it hurts, it hits home, it hits home. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, maybe it's because you couldn't hear. <laughs> it's quite ageist. <laughs> um, yeah, so bit more passion they I feel like they truly believed in, in in their ideas a lot more and for the future I think the everyday Kiwi we work pretty hard on our own industries and so they're probably not going to have the amount of time to DIY it themselves yeah great well done <laughs> Th thank you so much judges and look uh, can we have another round of applause just for both, both teams, because there's only one winner, but let's just thank them for that. <laughs> and, and it is with a little bit of trepidation I have to invite Rob back up um, to uh, present the winning team the trophy and probably have a few words to uh, say for uh, tonight. Rob. Yeah, so I stacked the agenda just to make sure he knew I had the last word, just to, just to dampen down some of the um, enthusiasm. So look, um, first of all, just to repeat that, thank you, everyone. Um, it takes a bit of courage to come up and come to one of these things, and I'm, I'm thrilled that it was, uh, it was conducted in a, a relatively polite spirit, um, <laughs> and that we all had a lot of laughs. So look, it, it really, um, you know, I take my hat off to people who are prepared to come and, in some cases, argue a argue a proposition they probably didn't 100% believe in, so um, that takes some courage. I'd also pick up on the last point, and from one of the questioners, um, I would say this, wouldn't I, but when we thought about this debate and the topic for it, uh, one of the struggles was, um, actually it takes everything, right? All we want to do is have an industry that serves the investors, and there are lots of different ways to skin those cats. Um, you can do it through fund managers, you can do it through um, platforms, in fact, you can do it through both. So um, it's good evidence, actually, that what we want are people, uh, irrespective of the channel, irrespective of the means, that have the investors' uh, interest and, and needs at heart. So to so all of the panelists, congratulations, because I think you all exhibited that passion tonight. So thank you very much. And I am going to actually... <laughs> These, these tremendous, no expense speed here, <laughs> un <laughs> undersized trophies. I, I did say to the team after watching the New Zealand cricket team come back with the, with the mace, um, just make sure the trophies aren't bigger than I am. <laughs> just ever, ever so slightly disappointing. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So I think David and I are going to hand out these oh, little uh, yes. little gifts. Maybe we'll we'll let everybody head to the bar and hand them out then. So um, I'm, am I going to finish, or no, you still got something so to say? I'm, still... I'm going to finish. You're going to finish now. Now you're up in my. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll hand those out after. But I'm going to stay up here just in case. Do, yeah. <laughs> That is a wrap, thankfully. Um, th look, uh, thanks so much for you coming out tonight and listening to this. It's a, it's, I think it's been an, uh, a, a really good, great discussion. Lots of fun, lots of laughter, and it's kind of unusual in our industry sometimes. So thank you for uh, enjoying this. And, and for those that attended online, of course, it's going to be rec recorded. Um, I want to do a, you know, a big shout out to Louise and Jesume and the, the comms team at the FMA. These things just don't happen by chance. It's a truckload of work. So well done on you guys for doing that. I really appreciate it. Please, uh, FMA is going to be putting some more stuff out on social media over the next few days. So look out for that. As you leave, there is a, a free copy to take. I know, that's unusual. Um, <laughs> lots of fees. Lots of, fees. Um, <laughs> of the uh, of the research that uh, is going to be made public tomorrow, I believe. Um, so uh, please please feel free to take that out. Thanks for those. Uh, thanks again for everyone for coming. And I think it's time now. Thank goodness for a beer. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>